you could spend ten thousand dollars on a pair of trainers it's not going to make you land with a tripod landing it's not going to make you leave the, the ground correctly we can't buy our way out of trouble it's i think it's easier to order something and for it to turn up on the doorstep and we put them on and it's a magic pair of trainers and now all our troubles are solved we'd rather do that than spend 12 weeks learning to move differently shane benzi welcome to the show thank you for the invite you were just in portugal tell me what you were doing I was just in Portugal. So I was in uh, a place called Nazaré. And Nazaré uh, has the biggest waves in the world. So it's on the Atlantic coast and uh, it has huge waves. And uh, I'm predominantly a running coach, but actually more and more I'm becoming a movement coach with different sports. And I'm actually working on a project out there studying and coaching some of the big wave surfers. So these guys are surfing waves up to sort of 70, 80 feet so I'm really get excited about, you know, their foot contacts on the board. How are they balancing on that board? You know, what are they doing? What's their perception of their movement, their mental approach to something that's pretty dangerous and that you can't just go out every day and practice because, of course, these big waves only come sometimes. So I use very clever sensors to put in their boots to kind of have a look at how they're interacting with the board and all sorts of stuff. And that does, believe it or not, feed back into running. What is the similarity between surfing and running? So for me, if I'm coaching running, one of the big things I get excited about with running is the, the foot. The, you know, the human foot is a very, very clever thing. And I like to think of the foot as the interface between us and the ground. Yeah. If the foot lands well and if the foot leaves the ground well when we run, it creates stability. It creates elasticity. It creates amazing proprioception from the quarter of a million nerves on the bottom of it. It spreads impact. It does loads of amazing things. So if I can understand how the foot interacts with lots of other surfaces uh, and in other sports, then I can learn some very interesting things about maybe how we should land the foot and leave the ground when we run. What are some of the things that you've learned since working with these psychopathic surfers? <laughs> Well, and one of the other big things about sport as well is, is the mental approach, you know, that that's that's extremely important. So we're learning all the time about the foot. The I, When I'm looking at uh, foot contact in whatever sport it is, I'm always looking where possible for what I would call a tripod contact with uh, the board or with the ground or whatever it is you're working with. So I'm learning from them about how they create stability in what is a very kind of dynamic situation and how that foot changes based on their interaction with the board and maybe then i can understand how better we should change and interact our foot as we mo move over maybe uneven surfaces or up hills or down hills because of course they're they are on uh, you know they're up going at some pretty crazy angles so yeah lots to learn and, and lots of information to swap i did a, a similar well say similar i had a have a collaboration with british diving um so worked with British diving in the, in the lead up to the Olympics uh, and uh, just looking at how the divers have their, their, their movement on the board. Not the twirly stuff. That's all really exciting and impressive. But I just work with them on their three steps on the board and then how they leave the board. So looking at things in minute detail, but then maybe bringing them back into running is something we might do tens of thousands of times in a single run. What about fear? What did you learn to do with the mindset of these guys? They're running, they're uh, swimming out to go down these 60, 70, 80 foot waves. How are they coping with the nerves and anxiety before and during and keeping themselves in the zone? Well, I think I think for sports, you know, for athletes, and, and I think when I, when I say athlete, I think that's anybody who does sport. I think anybody who does anything athletic is an athlete. I think with athletes, I think uh, fear, excitement, being nervous, I think they're actually good things because that produces adrenaline and that gets us maybe in the place that we need to be. So I think they are good things. I think what the surfers do a lot of and what I try and get my athletes to do is a huge amount of visualization. So when they come to surf a big wave, they visualize that wave many times and they visualize what they're going to do on that wave many, many times. So they don't try and sort of ward off that, that nervousness or, or that fear because you need a healthy respect for the ocean. Um, but uh, yeah, they channel it so that it produces a gentleman that goes in the right way. And yeah. then their, their ability yeah, to, to visualize what's, what's going to happen and how to deal with it. I have a friend, Bridget Fettersey, who's a, a comedian, and she has a little mantra before she goes on stage. Every time that she goes on stage, she gets butterflies in her stomach and her palms get sweaty and her heart rate increases. She just keeps telling herself, 
I'm not nervous. I'm excited. I'm not nervous. I'm excited. I'm not nervous. I'm excited. And I use that. I had, I've done a couple of big things recently and, uh, I'm not nervous. I'm excited is a really fucking good mantra because (laughs) the difference between being nervous and being excited really is just the framing that you put around it. Physiologically, it manifests in a pretty similar way. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, you know, but coming on, coming on the show today, you know, there's that minute before you're about to sort of hit that button and come on, you're thinking, OK. And I think what I do and I think what, it, what what's good for sport as well is if you get that initial minute right, if you get that first minute right, if you're confident about how you approach and then you've started in control, then you adapt to where it goes. So someone might chuck you a, a tricky question and then you, you'll deal with that. But if you start in control and if you feel in control, I think that's good. And I guess that's what the surfers are doing, you know, when they're, when they're towed onto that wave by the jet ski. I think they're thinking, right, you know, I've done this a thousand times. This is what we do. This is how I'm, this is how I'm entering the wave. And I'll now deal with the wave in the way that I have to deal with it. But if, if you start in control, I think that's, a, that's the best you can do. What do people mean when they call you the Indiana Jones of running? Yeah. So, so my work really is, I, you know, I literally do travel all over the world um, to chase chasing human movement that that's kind of what i'm doing because you know if i if i if i watch a runner run or if i analyze a runner or i'm coaching a runner i'm coaching a human a part, you know a part of the human species i'm coaching an animal if you were and so i travel all over the world trying to track down what is good human movement and i trace athletes all around the world to lots of different environments often extreme environments like jungle um, arctic uh, high mountains, um, Amazon jungle, rainforest, to understand how they adapt to these uh, extreme environments. But I also spend a lot of time with tribes and indigenous people as well, people who do incredible things with their bodies but aren't necessarily race, wearing a race number, but do mm. amazing things. I might go and live with the Sherpas who will carry twice their body weight all day or go and, go and live with the Batek tribe in the, in the Malaysian rainforest who are amazing tree climbers. How are they doing that? So humans are incredibly good at adapting their software, their brains and their hardware, their body to different tasks around the world to suit their environment. But isn't that what an athlete's doing? An athlete is adapting their body to a specific task. So the more I can understand, A, what is good human movement and B, how to adapt that human movement to a specific task. I think the better coach I can be. So I think that's where the Indiana Jones thing has come from, is because I'm just constantly chasing this thing around the planet. That uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the whole, it's that that holy grail of what is human movement and and how to adapt it and coach it. Yeah, it's interesting to talk about it being a a lost art. I, I, I'm not so sure what, I'm, what you mean by being a lost art. We've just had someone run a sub two hour marathon. It doesn't seem like running is that much of a lost art to me. Sure. Well, actually, I was there when when Eliud Kipchoge did it in Vienna. I was I was there for the for the sub two. Um, and so, I mean, he's a, he's a good example. So, you know, he Eliud Kipchoge didn't run a sub two marathon because he ran like a hunter gatherer. He ran a sub two marathon because he harnessed all of the gifts that Mother Nature gave him as a running species. And then he maximized as much potential as he could out of his software, his brain and his hardware. Yeah, he turned it into human performance. But because the the environment that you and I live in is not the natural environment that humans grew up in. So before before I was working, before I was studying human movement, I was working with sharks. Okay. So sharks, so I did stuff with great white sharks. So great white sharks have been around for about 400 million years and their environment hasn't really changed over that time. You know, they just swim around, have baby sharks and eat seals. That's water's that. water, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So nothing's really changed for them in 400 million years. So they've got amazingly good at swimming around in a very efficient way and living in an efficient way. For us, for as us humans, you know, that's really not the case. We've been around in a, in a blink of an eyelid at that time. And in that time, we've gone from hunter-gatherers to farmers. We've gone through the industrial revolution and now the technological revolution. So we're actually like a fish out of water really now. You know, we, we, don't, we no longer live in an environment that we were designed to live in. And so because of that, we're adapting what we do to our new environment. So it is a lost art. Movement is becoming a lost art because we're no longer the animal that we were. So we're no longer moving in that way. And what's really fascinating is 
if you were to go out this afternoon and, and, and run around it's minus eight in new york city i'm not going out there and running around anywhere. Have, well you'd have to run just to stay alive it precisely was, um, yeah that's correct if you, if you ran around central park your movement would actually be based on two big things there are many things but the two big things are the environment that you spend your day in so if you're sitting at the moment so if you spend a lot of your day sitting your skeleton is essentially free flowing in a sea of tension it's 206 bones that don't t- touch each other they just sit in an elastic sea of tension and that sea of tension in your body is created during the day when you're static you then take that out into dynamic movement So if you ran around in Central Park, you're actually going to be running with the sea of tension in your body that you've created for the other 23 hours of the day. The second big challenge for us is that our movement is based on our perception of our movement. Yeah. And you think, well, I have no perception. I just run. I just go out for a run. I have no perception. We all do, even if it's a subliminal perception. And our subliminal perception of our movement is one that's based on the traditional view of biomechanics which makes us feel mechanical. The clue is almost in the word. We makes us feel like we're moving as a series of levers and our skeleton is a structure. So we move in a block-like mechanical way. But actually, that's not the case at all. But because of our new environment, we sit a lot and we're static a lot. And because of our new environment, we are educated about our movement in a way that's based on biomechanics, which makes us feel mechanical. So those two things are creating a world that means that our movement is almost becoming like a lost language it's changing because our environment and it's getting harder and harder for me to have to go further and further afield to find people that aren't looking down into mobile phones and that aren't sitting even in the last decade that's become much harder Mm. you have gone and studied a bunch of different groups looking at their movement looking at how they move themselves through and not all of them were runners right so the sherpas i think you you tried to get them to run and and basically they weren't they weren't particularly fantastic at running but they're very very good at strong uh, heavy carries two times their body weight and stuff like that yeah. of all of the people that you studied who had the most beautiful running form naturally so the east africans i think you know you'd have to go a long way to beat the the ethiopians and the kenyans and i think for me mainly the the kenyans i think they move beautifully what is it how would you characterize the way that they move they move with a lot of height in their body it's elegant yeah it's elegant they move with elegance so this sea of tension if i'm just going to show you this so this is a kind of it's a child's toy okay Mm -hmm. but it's actually a tensegrity model okay now the concept of tensegrity or bio tensegrity for you as a human is as i said earlier the 206 bones that are your skeleton are free flowing in a sea of tension. So this child's toy kind of tells that story. The wooden dowels are your bones and the elastic stuff that holds the toy together are your tendons and your ligaments and something called myofascia. So actually when you move your skeleton, it just free flows in a sea of elasticity and that elastic tension is created by your fascial system. So if you get beautifully tall in your movement, When you move, you move with a lot of elastic recoil. You have connective tissue that runs from your toes continuously right up into your skull. Now, when the East Africans run, they run with beautiful height in their body. So they really load that elastic system and they do that beautifully. But you know what's really fascinating and what I think is is really exciting as well is that when you watch Hello, with Kipcho, the mm. Wilson Kipsang, Ronex Caputo, world record holders that I've been lucky to spend time with. You know, they move beautifully. But if I was to ask them to list the top 10 things that uh, made, what, what made them think they were great runners, they would put movement pretty much at the bottom, which is a little bit disconcerting for me because I'm a movement coach. Mm. You know, the reason why they put it at the bottom is because they don't know they learned it because they learn it by running in the group. So by flow, by the power of the group, by osmosis, by being surrounded by beautiful movement, they start to move in that same way. It isn't coached as a technical skill. They just join in with the group. They mimic. Yes. Well, I had a, a guy that wrote a book about Rene Girard, who, you know, he his entire thing was this mimetic desire 
and he saw it as a social phenomenon that we want what other people want to want and then we presume that that's what we want so are you saying that there is an equivalent here but biomechanically that we see other people around us we m- mimic the way that they move and that becomes a part of i remember when i was playing cricket you know growing up and you'd see one of the lads that was a, a quicker bowler than you or a better batsman than you or a better thrower than you and you'd th- try and pick apart or at least i would i'd try and pick apart the little things that they did presuming that there must be some component of their movement which is contributing to these effective outcomes and um yeah, it makes sense and that i suppose as well in that way that you don't need to break it down biomechanically if you have effective runners in the group and you run with the group and you watch the group then you become an effective runner as a byproduct of being there completely and it becomes your default much easier because it wasn't a learned skill so when you're running so hard and trying so hard that you don't even know your own name your default is going to be relaxation and beautiful movement because that, that that's how you learned it by running in the group we could learn a lot from that we a huge amount from is that. there a um is there an implication here that the people who are training and running especially uh, as youngsters that you want to get them into a group with other high caliber very very uh, precise movers completely absolutely and again i think it's one of the things that certainly in the uk that we don't do so well and, and you know and, and it is a challenge because if you had three groups of runners and you were going to take them running it makes sense for the fast runners to run together they're not so fast and then they're pretty slow um but it means they're pretty slow never get to mimic precisely you end up with this sort of them and us scenario where it starts to split out yeah but what the east africans do which is ingenious is that so they have the same problem because boy they've got some very very fast runners and some fast runners are not quite so fast so everything's at upper level but there are different speeds but they do this very clever thing where they will have a, a, a grid system so take you think of something four times like maybe four soccer fields the size of four soccer fields and they will have the runners running but it's it's in diagonals across these football fields or they make the size of these soccer fields so they run in diagonals so you are constantly running past world record holders you're constantly then running behind them then towards them you're always moving in different angles across these pitches but you never leave the best runners in the world even though you're a complete beginner and that's why they've done it? Is that one of the reasons that they've said that they've done it, to get people around these beautiful running yeah. form guys? Yeah, so they can see each other moving, and also it's easier for the coaches to be in the middle of those diagonals and watch everything that's going on. Nobody really disappears. Oh, yeah, of course, because every, you don't actually have to go all that far away, but you can still run a far distance. That's really, really clever. It is. It's, it's ingenious. You can have, you know, sometimes you can have as much sports science as you like and, you know, and as much funding as you like, but sometimes... Just the simple things are uh, really, really helpful. Look at and your so, son's matchbox cars track setup and just duplicate that for a running method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's re- it works amazingly well. And you know, people maybe listening to the podcast might be able to kind of relate to this. That if you do a marathon or a half marathon, sometimes it's an out and a back. And as you're still going out, the fast ones are coming back. And for that fleeting moment, you see them and you think, "Wow, how, look at them! Well, that's amazing." Well, you get to see them for two hours, just constantly weaving in and out. It's very, it's, it's a great thing, and we we could, I think, we could learn a lot from that. So, if that's the Kenyans and they're the best runners on the planet, talk to me about the Sherpas because they're strong guys. Nims Perger, who did the uh, fourteen peaks challenge, he uh, he was on the show a little while ago, and he's a complete um, freak too. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. They're incredible. I mean, and this is so. I I've been to Nepal. I used to climb. Uh, and I'd been to Nepal maybe 25 years ago um, and was in complete awe of the Sherpas then, but wasn't a coach or a movement coach. Um, just thought they were amazing people. But then when I started to become a movement coach and started to think, right, OK, well, what is what is strength? You know, what is strength? I think we in the Western world see our strength as muscle. Yeah. If, if you're talking about strength, we tend to think of muscle strength. But I don't I don't see that. I think that it comes from actually a symbiotic relationship between bone, muscle and fascia that like that children's toy, it creates that sea of tension. Mm. And just like I'd thought, right, okay, well, where do I think the best runners in the world are? Where are the strongest people? Where where, where are the strongest people? And I'd seen when I was in in Nepal 25 years ago, Sherpas carrying almost comical loads. It was just absurd where you could barely just see a little pair of legs and just this huge load to the point where it looked like something out of a cartoon. 
And uh, I thought, right, I'm going back. I'm going to study it. And I found an amazing guy. Um, and uh, he allowed me to come to his village. He's a very remote village. You can only trek in. And um, and I stayed in the village. And uh, the Sherpas, there were there were three Everest summiters in, in the village. And the, the, the Sherpas yeah. were back because back it was off the climbing season. So I think they had something like 24 summits between them. And, uh, and, and, and was also spending time in the Sherpa community, trying to understand and crack this code of why they are so strong and yet actually pretty slight and certainly not muscular to, to look at. And also, why would they carry everything around their head when all the smart people are carrying big weights over their shoulders, you would think? So, A, why can they carry weights that we couldn't even look at and why are they suspending them around their forehead? That's, why would they do that? that? I found that really, really interesting. And if we can learn, I thought, right, if I can learn what, why they can do that, then that's going to give me some really good ideas about how maybe runners can run with small packs on their back. Or, yeah. you know, and, I, and I've worked, I've worked with the military as well. Um, and obviously carrying weights and stuff like that is obviously pretty important. So, so I went out to live with the Sherpas and to study them and to understand them studying the power of the group as well which i would love to talk to you about because i think that's massive it's, it's everything actually um so studying the power of the group and also how they move and they really did show me that actually it isn't muscle strength at all it is this symbiotic relationship between bone muscle and fascia that doesn't just create an elastic body yeah. it creates a very strong body and this continuous elastic tissue that runs from our toes continuously up our body actually finishes in our skull in the top of our head and that's why they carry the weights around the forehead because if you hang something off your shoulders you've actually cut off the last link of your strength an elastic chain by suspending something around your head you incorporate every single part of the chain but of presu- presumably they don't know or they haven't broken down the biomechanics of how the fascial system works what no. they've done is they've tried it on the shoulders they've tried it in their hand they've tried it around their waist they've tried it attached to their knees dragging it behind them and they've ended up saying look it would appear so it's just a, an evolution of what was most effective absolutely and if you travel around the world um, and go to the more, more far flung places people are carrying things either around their head or on their head yeah yeah well you see that with um ladies carrying water for the tribes right you know going to whatever the, the local well is and then carrying it back on top of their heads yeah it's so interesting when you see taking the approach that you have as somebody that does the the sports science you know real technical analysis of running movement and so on and so forth but then when you go and you just look at evolution of what was effective what was it that people did who were good at this thing what are they doing how can we then repurpose that so we're having to re-engineer our own movement in this way yeah yeah i think i, I think i think it's the way because you know a human six million years ago we would have been quadrupeds, so we would have been on all fours and very muscular with, with a lot of muscle. And we wouldn't have moved really very far. We'd have probably moved around about the size of those four soccer fields. Why did we need, uh, why did we need so much muscle? Why did we need so much muscle? Well, I think I, it's, it's a good point. I don't know, because if you, were a, uh, if you were a primate, you wouldn't actually need to have a huge amount of muscle to to get your food you're but not carrying stuff no but then i guess if you're competing for a mate it probably helps to be pretty strong and really evolution is about you know the strongest or the fittest or the, the most able to to reproduce passes on their genes so i guess through evolution it, the stronger you were the more able you were able to get a mate well one thing could be that the the muscle size is less a function and more a signal it's mm. not that you're actually concerned about what the muscles can do. It's that these muscles are almost like um, everybody knowing that you've got some nukes in the I arsenal. Did. You don't yeah. necessarily need to even use them, but if you didn't have them, they wouldn't work as a deterrent. And if you're looking to signal, I am a strong and capable provider to my family. Uh, and I mean, I, I've heard some stories about two or three chimps can quite easily rip another chimp limb from limb. Oh, they do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty disturbing sight. And I think it's a disturbing sight because we kind of relate ourselves quite. That was us not long ago. Yeah, absolutely. And it can be quite a disturbing thing to to see. But 
we took a different so we would have been six million years ago those quadrupeds and quite muscular and really not moving very far off those four soccer pitches and then we did two things we developed a very clever foot and we developed the ability to stand tall and get elastic that meant we could cover more ground with more efficiency catch more food get bigger brains get a space program now i'm not saying we've been more successful than the primate yeah. but a human's USP is a very clever foot and the ability to stand tall and get elastic and dynamic and efficient. So when it comes to playing sport, if your sport allows it, we should get as much height in that body as we can because that's a human's USP. Given the fact that the Sherpas aren't jacked out of their minds, bodybuilder style guys, what have you learned is what is the function of strength or what sorry what is the contributing elements to strength you know if the bodybuilder or the powerlifter or the crossfitter isn't the person that can carry the most uh, weight per kilo of body mass it's the sherpa what is it that they're doing where, where is their strength coming from so so it's a good question. So, so strength and conditioning is huge at the moment. Yeah, there's a lot of strength and conditioning in sports. And let's let's say we were coaching running. Yeah, let's say we were we were co- talking about coaching running here. If I went to the gym and I did a lot of squats and lunges and were lifting weights in the gym to get strong, really, I'm getting strong at lunging and squatting, and I'm getting strong at lifting weights. It's not really taking into account the deceleration as I hit the ground when I run. It's not really taking into account the impact that I create when I run. And yeah. it's not really taking into account the range of motion. So I think what's, what's, te- what's happening and what's happening more and more is we're building strength, but which not that strength is not specific for the sport that we want to do. So a Sherpa doesn't get up at six o'clock in the morning and go to the gym and pump iron to get good at carrying twice their body weight. Yep. What they do, carry twice their body weight. And obviously they have to build up to that with with weight. But they do the task. And if I watch the East Africans when they're running, largely I see them running and doing their strength and conditioning on the move. If you run, if you do any kind of activity, you're stressing bones, you're tearing muscle fibres, yeah, and you're tearing fascia. They will be rejuvenated, re-architect, re- remolded, rebuilt during recovery. So and it, fast better. In this way, in the current modern approach for strength and conditioning for particular pursuits, have we just overcomplicated it? Have we thought that we can use strength and conditioning kit and a hex bar deadlift and a, a bunch of elastic bands and stuff? Um in order to create quicker, more appropriate adaptation, whereas we should just be doing more of the specific pursuit that we're trying to do ourselves? Yeah, I think there's definitely a balance. I think there's definitely a balance. But yes, I think we are moving. I think there's a tendency to move away from trying to do the actual movement beautifully and have in mind that by doing that movement beautifully, you're breaking down the body and it will re-architect itself. So it's what I would call Darwinian fitness. Yeah, so fitness to perform the task. That, that's how we evolve. So if you want to throw the javelin, you can go in the gym and get very strong and build a very powerful body. But that, but that software and the hardware, it doesn't need to say that it's good at throwing the javelin. If you go out and throw the javelin 20 times, you're going to stress the body and then the body will rebuild itself, allowing you to do that task better. So I'm sure there's a balance. Mm-hmm. And I guess as a coach, my job is to get the athlete thinking because that's what coaching is. I think if you drill someone, you just get them someone to do something a lot in the hope they get better at it. And that will probably happen. They probably will get better if they do it a lot. But if they think about how they're doing it and why they're doing it and they take ownership of it themselves and they're very cognitive about it, that's when they maximize their potential. And I think that's what a coach should hope to do is empower the athlete to take ownership of that skill, not just drill them lots of times to do it. There's something that I've noticed with some of my friends. I'm friends with a bunch of different buddies who are uh, elite-level CrossFitters and, uh, and other sports guys as well. There seems to be, and I want the ones that are listening to take this in the, the nicest way possible, there seems to be a good blend of 
thoughtfulness and ignorant stupidity that is important to be an elite level uh, athlete. And what I mean by that is that you need to take enough of a detailed approach of the things that you are doing in order to really be able to cover all of the different bases. However, the guys that I know that overthink, they don't just follow the training plan sufficiently. You know, there's, an, there's a level of um, insight and intellect that you need to have mm. in order to be able to talk yourself out of your own training plan. And some people can be too smart for their own good when it comes to training and start to question the things. There is an amount of uh, sort of dunderheaded Neanderthal approach that you need where it's, look, it's a, it's a, a 60 minute monostructural workout just at, at, at like a zone two or a zone three on a Thursday morning. It's the most boring standard workout that I'm ever going to do. You just need to go and do it. Mm. And yet I've certainly seen friends in the past who will, oh, well, if I can, if I, if I can add some intervals into, I know it says on the training plan that I'm supposed to do X. So is there, um, is there a, a, a sweet spot here between the level of detail that the athlete is supposed to take and then the amount that they're supposed to kind of switch that off and then just rely on the programming too? Yeah, I, absolutely. I think there is a balance. And I think that's where you need that coach to control the overall thing and to be able to say, well, look, this is the schedule and this is what we should be doing. Yes. But the, the athlete is the only person on every run or every wave or throwing every javelin or fencing or whatever it might be. So they're the ones that can feel everything. They're the ones that have to make the the, the split decision. So they need as much ownership of it as they, as they possibly can, because in any sport, the moment the whistle or the horn goes off, all bets are off. It's everything, all on them. Yeah, everything's changing now, from now, and it's the person that can adapt the best. And if you've just been drilled, that's not really conducive to adapting to something that will almost certainly happen. How far were our ancestors running in one go? So there's my the, my go-to person, the person that I love to listen to and I think makes absolute sense is uh, a guy called Daniel Lieberman, Professor Lieberman. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. No. Amazing, absolutely amazing guy, runner, anthropologist, fantastic. And, you know, he was going out to Kenya a long time ago and, and looking at how everyone was moving. He's, he's absolutely fantastic. So he would kind of say really about, uh, they would run about maybe a half marathon at about a four hour marathon pace. So to go back to my original statement of Kipchoge did not break the sub two by running like a hunter gatherer because clearly he, he would have pulled up a lot earlier. Yes, yes. So there was some running. There was quite a lot of walking. Yeah, and 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 actually, you know, a lot of times sitting and digging roots and, and and doing stuff like that. So what we're doing now is taking human movement and turning it into human performance, and that's when we have to adapt our software and our hardware. So it's really interesting because if you look at humans, if you watch a human move, humans are very wonky, imbalanced things. A human has a stabilizing leg and it has a probing leg. Yeah. It has a stabilizing arm and a manipulating arm because different sides of the brain. Well, that's how a human's designed. But if you want to squeeze as much performance of a hu out of a human as you can, you need to eradicate those and create as much balance and symmetry in the body as you can, certainly for running. Different sports might need different things if it's a very one-sided sport with one side of the body. So we're taking, and this is why it's a challenge, because we're taking this fish that is out of water, yep. that is not living in the environment it was designed to be lived in anymore, and now trying to squeeze incredible performance out of it to do ever more amazing things. And that's why we have to really think about it rather than just try hard or just do it a lot. So you're saying that persistence hunting typically would have pulled up at the, the animal would have overheated within 13 miles or we would have lost it on average something like that. Yeah, so so it said so we would have run walked. So essentially okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we would have we would have walked and run walked and run. So yeah, but essentially the idea of persistence hunting is you you get an animal that's technically much faster than you over a shorter distance, keep it in and keep it in eyesight and just keep it moving because it can't carry water and it can't sweat. So it's going to overheat a lot quicker than us. What I suppose so the thing that I had in my head because I've never persistence hunted surprisingly uh is that the animal would have just gone and then gone and you might have lost sight of it but if I was an animal and I knew that I didn't have an unlimited gas tank, I would run 
faster away. Then I'd turn around and look and I'd wait and see, are they still coming? Oh shit, they're still coming. Right. Okay. I'll run a bit more, mm. turn around and look. So I suppose that, yeah, the, the, um, the fact that you would stop, I guess the guys would maybe be stopping to make sure that the tracks are going in the right direction. If perhaps they've lost sight of it directly. Absolutely. They're, they're trackers as, as much as hunters and in, in the exactly. You're not going to be able to keep that animal in your view the whole time. So their ability to track and understand almost put their self in the animal's position. In Where the would animal. it run? Yeah, it's going to steer clear of those trees. It's going towards that, whatever. Yeah, exactly. And the acceleration and the constant acceleration and deceleration, the stopping and starting of the animal is incredibly tiring. If you go to a shopping mall or if you go to a, uh, a museum and you're walking around and stopping and looking and walking and stopping and walking around and looking, that's actually quite tiring. Mm. And it's because of that constant stopping and starting, accelerating and decelerating and stopping. You're far better just rolling along. Because I think we, you know, even it's interesting with, with, with certainly with running, is we built up this incredibly adversarial relationship with the ground. Because we blame the ground for impact and we blame impact for injuries. And, and so we try and avoid impact. And uh, we've almost become scared of the ground and the moment we can sort of the moment we can step up and, and walk across the kitchen floor for the first time our, our feet are rammed into shoes to, to protect us from the dirty ground and and so we don't have a great relationship with the ground and yet when i travel all around the world and see people that are growing up in their feet yeah. they have a beautiful relationship with the ground they're not scared of the ground they hit the ground beautifully and creates elastic energy and springs them off whereas we're trying to spend as much money as we can to buy, buy very clever trainers that will claim to protect us from the ground and, and make yes you know, i mean this has been uh, this has been probably the, the most interesting thing to watch as a, a non-runner uh, over the last few years it's been the development in shoe technology and then the subsequent uh, litigation that's come in you know the the solution that that was um created in order to restrict the amount of real estate and, and technology that can go into shoes was just to restrict the stack height right that was the solution okay you have this amount of real estate to play with which is where the soul fits within that put a rocket booster put 25 carbon plates do whatever you want but this is how much you have because if you look at what kipchoge uh broke the two-hour marathon barrier in they're like platform shoes they're almost comical right they're so big mm -hmm. these huge things so what are your thoughts about the modern developments in running shoes and then also what are your thoughts on minimalist running shoes or, or barefoot running shoes so i think the big thing is that we should try not to get so excited about any kind of shoes and just get really excited about the human foot because as I said earlier on, the human foot, as well as being able to stand tall, the human foot, the very clever human foot is our USP. It creates, because everything we're trying to create with technology is emulating what the amazing human foot has. Creating stability, creating elasticity, spring, dissipation of impact, proprioception. The foot's amazing at all of that. We're, what we're actually doing is wrapping the, that amazing foot in rubber and then putting some technology on it. So. Yeah. What I would try, what I would urge everybody to do is get excited about their feet, first of all, because you could spend $10,000 on a pair of trainers. It's not going to make you land with a tripod landing. You could spend £20,000 on a pair of trainers. It's not going to make you leave the, the ground correctly. So, you know, we can't buy our way out of trouble. It's, I think it's easier to order something and for it to turn up on the doorstep and we put them on and it's a magic pair of trainers and now all our troubles are solved. We'd rather do that than spend 12 weeks learning to move differently. Mm. So, so let's not get suckered into that. And let's, let's, uh, create, let's create an amazing human foot that has an amazing relationship with the ground. And then let's put our foot in a pair of trainers that helps our foot interact with the environment it wants to move through. Because that's what the trainers should be doing. Because clearly, our feet can't—we can't run around bare feet anymore. We just—we just don't have those feet. We can't do it. I mean, people do in other parts of the world, but we can't. We don't have that foot anymore. So, we need to utilize this amazing human foot, but then choose something to put it in that allows us to stick to rock or run through mud or whatever it might be. So that the trainers interact with the environment, but we do all the clever stuff with our foot. But that's what? where. What about minimalist shoes? Well, it would make sense because we kind of want and we want to emulate, you know, how our ancestors move and move naturally. It would make perfect sense to go to something completely minimalist because then we'd be there. But again, 
we're not that animal anymore. And so we have to be very, very careful about wearing something minimalist with zero drop because that's going to put our Achilles tendon and our calf muscles under a lot of pressure because that's not what we've been doing. And suddenly we've got we're running around and we've got two and a half times our body weight coming back at us because that's what it is when you're running. It's around two and a half times your body weight. That can create a huge amount of stress on the body. The body has to adapt to that. And so if we are going to go to something minimalist, we there has to be a very slow transition. Yeah. Bone, what, bone remodeling takes 17 weeks. So if you started to move differently today, it takes 17 weeks for the for the bones to kind of remodel and create density where where they need to be dense. So, you know, running around in the park in in, some, in a bare, in, in actual bare feet or something very minimalist can be good fun. Um, but be very, very careful. And again, don't assume that, that wearing next to nothing on your feet will make you move beautifully as well, because it it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. We have to learn that skill and then pair, choose a pair of trainers that allow us to do it. A very wide toe cap in the trainers is good to allow that foot to splay. OK. Um, we tend to hem our feet in with trainers. So a nice wide toe cap is, is a good thing to have. You see that in, I think, a lot of the shoes that are really architected to try and have good foot movement, that they, they seem to be almost, if you look at them, kind of like flippers. You know, yeah. they kind of they look a little bit silly at the end, but presumably that's for the, exactly this reason, to give it a bigger toe box so that you have that room for everything to move. So, okay, we've, we've sort of spoken about some of the key principles that you think contribute to great running form. One of them's been this tripod landing. What's that mean? So a tripod landing is essentially when you when you, when we land the foot. If you imagine you've got uh, so a tripod has three points to it. You've got a point just sort of underneath the ball of the big toe, a point underneath where the ball of the little toe would be, and then the heel, the calcaneus. So you can almost draw that tripod. If you get that tripod landing, tripods give us stability, so we get instant stability when we land. And then the tripod landing allows the arch of the foot to work correctly. The arch of the foot gives our foot its strength. That's why we use arches in architecture. Yep. And the arch of the foot also creates a dome effect for the foot. If we land on the tripod landing, the dome effect of the foot works. And we use domes in architecture because we want to spread weight. So and also if we land on that tripod landing, it means we load at something called our plantar fascia correctly, which is a beautiful piece of elastic that runs along the bottom of the foot. We load that plantar fascia, that piece of elastic, that springs us off. And then maybe the most important subjective, but for me, I get very excited about it. You've got a quarter of a million nerve endings on the bottom of your foot. OK, there are more nerves in your feet than there are your hands. Two types of nerve endings, extra receptors. The yep. extra receptors, they tell you how hard you hit the ground and what the ground felt like. Was it bumpy, soft, rocky, moving? And then you have proprioceptors in that nerve network. They give you your spatial awareness and they give you a perceived rate of exertion, how hard you're trying. So every time your foot lands, those quarter of a million nerve endings are telling you everything you want to know about your environment as you're running over it. So if you get the tripod landing, you instantly get all of that information. When you say tripod landing, do you mean heel and those two ball points strike at the same time that if you were to yeah. put them onto the floor that they would be straight down flat okay um yeah. what is the most common type of foot striking mechanism that you see at the moment so over the over the last decade i've worked with over 4000 runners and many in groups but 4000 runners where i video them and work with them and and all the time i'm coaching them also taking data up until the last 18 months or so um, of that 4,000 runners that I saw, 84% of them heel strike. So they land on their heel first on a relatively straight leg. Yeah, 84%. That's, that's now at 63%. So over the last 18 months, that's changed. It has got, it's changed to 63%. So it's coming down. What's happened? That's a really big difference over 18 months. What's happened? Well, I guess to a large degree, a lot of the people that come and see me have read my book. And uh, so the book, uh, there's a selection book, effect going on there. Yeah, you'd have to assume. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So Some so worldwide you, pandemic, we didn't realize that COVID had actually changed people's uh, foot strikes. <laughs> it's, not, it's not good for breathing, but it's fantastic for your gait and your cadence. 
it could be the thing. It could it might not be my book at all. That might be just wishful thinking. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, lots more people that are coming. And I work remote. I work with remote video analysis with people on six continents as well. And even the, it, and we're seeing it with them as well. So it's coming down. I mean, you could argue that that's that's not good enough. You know, I, it should, I should write a better book. It should be better. It should be less than 62. I should up my game a little bit here. But yeah, so that's what you're generally seeing. And that's what we see now. And it's interesting because a human is designed to land on its heel when it walks. That's what a human does. If you went for a walk around Central Park now, you would be landing on a heel on a relatively straight leg and then rolling through. So what happened a few decades ago now mm. is we started running with a walking gait. Yeah. So the difference between running and walking is when you walk, one foot is always on the ground. When you run, you get air. Both feet come off the ground at, at the same time uh, during the, yeah. the strong. So we can be running technically because we're getting air, but we're doing it with a walking gait. Jogging, I guess, is, that's how most people would describe it as jogging. So you and listen, there's no such thing as there's no such thing as bad exercise, by the way. You know, it's, it's good to get out and do stuff. Um, but essentially what, what I'm seeing a, a lot of is people technically running, but with a walking gait landing on that heel on a straight leg. Why? Because I think really, because they're running a relatively a slow pace, and so they're not creating very much air, and so there isn't any air for us to get our legs circling and cycling underneath us. So the leg can only land out in front of the street. Because we've been told one of the big urban myths of running, there are lots of urban myths of running. One is that impact is bad. We're all running around trying yeah. to avoid impact. Well, impact turns into elastic energy and throws you forward. One of the other big urban myths is that air or bounce in your run is bad, is inefficient. We are told to suck ourselves down to the ground. But if you think of your stride, the stride is a curve. It kind of is. You leave the ground, you go into the air. And then you land. Your stride is a curve. Mm -hmm. If you limit the amount of height you get in your curve, you can only have little curves. So we're all running around trying to suck ourselves down to the ground because we've been told that's efficient. So all we can do is land on a heel on a straight leg out in front of us, which ironically means we don't dissipate the impact we've been trying to avoid by going high. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so this sort of shuffle is is a function of people not running particularly quickly and also trying to limit the amount of impact that they're hitting the floor with. Well, I see this in myself. You know, I'd, I've never had running analysis done, but when I think about the way that I run, I absolutely heel strike. You know, I'd think about sort of the pronation of the foot and about where I'm striking it, but I didn't think that I was supposed to supposed to land with that, that tripod position. Um, what about head position? Because I know that's another big part of this. Yeah, head position is absolutely fundamental and it's really exciting because it's fundamental and incredibly doable to, to, to get it right. So if we go back to how a human was designed and evolution, you know, a human was designed, really designed to stand up very tall, look around for food and make sure that they didn't become food. So the head belongs up with the eye line on the horizon, essentially. And there are th so it's, if it, We've talked about this elastic connective fascia, this tissue that runs continuously from our toes up into our skull. We need our head up eye line on the horizon because that creates beautiful tension then in our elastic system. Also, your inner ear, your vestibular area, your inner ear, mm -hmm. that's where your balance and spatial awareness comes from. So the head really needs to be up where it was designed to be for that balance and spatial awareness to be right. If it's down, then that's a problem. And mo walking around with mobile phones and just sitting looking at mobile phones, we spend so much of our time now with our head down. Huge amounts. What's the difference in weight between your head when it's up and your head when it's leaning over? So are you a pounds or a kilo? Who are we, what are we going pounds? Kilos, or? kilos. So your head, the human head weighs, your, some of that weighs slightly more than others, but the human head weighs around about five kilos, okay? When it's, eye line on the horizon for every inch forward it comes forward it weighs another five kilos so if your head is three inches down you've now got a 20 kilo head now actually the head itself doesn't get heavier it's it's a it's, it's a moments thing in, in physics it's essentially it, it, it's spread so it's actually the spot the the upper neck and the spine that is now taking that quadruple weight yeah and and so and, what, and i'll tell you what's really been interesting is 
with, with you know the pandemic we've had over the last couple of years and people are wearing masks of course actually to see your phone because the mask restricts your view people are, our heads are coming down even further so instead of putting the phone up in front of our faces actually we crane our head even more to oh, allow wow yeah of course so that so when we talk we were joking earlier on about the pandemic and does it make you land on a tripod and all of this sort of stuff well actually one of the offsets from this, which is pretty unta- intangible at the moment, but people's head positions are c- changing quite substantially. Another probably another five kilos on the, the the distribution weight of your head because of a mask. I can see it. I can see it. Even though the mask weighs three grams, the yeah. impact of the mask is causing you. That is so interesting. What that, about, um, talk to me about stride length, stride length and cadence and turnover and stuff like that. So, so yeah, so cadence, we've all come, we've all got pretty obsessed with cadence over the years. I think because cadence is the first one, the first running dynamic that we could monitor. And, and so it's the one that the technology joined in with first. And so for anybody listening who doesn't know what cadence is, it's essentially how many times our feet hit the ground in a minute. And the holy grail of cadence has always been talked about as being 180. So we are told that when we run around, we should be hitting the ground 180 times a minute. Three times a second. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, and that's true as it goes, but not for the reason we've been told generally. So remember I said 84% of those 4,000 runners were heel striking on a straight leg, and that's now gone down to 62%. Well, the average cadence for those people was 163. Okay. So the average runner, if there is such a thing, is running around at 163 cadence, landing on a heel on a straight leg. And we don't want that. So what started to happen was coaches would get metronomes and put a metronome onto somebody or just get them running at a cadence of 180. So they speed their cadence up from 163 on average to 180, which meant that their feet would turn over quicker and land more underneath them, no longer on a heel. So that sounds like a good antidote, but it's a bit, a little bit like sticking a plaster over a fracture because you've tricked the person into not heel striking anymore. You haven't changed their gait. You haven't really changed anything. You just made them have stride length of a mouse so yeah, that yeah. people land underneath them. But the moment they try and run fast again or open their stride, they're just going to go back to landing on a heel on a straight. So for anybody listening out there who's monitoring their cadence, do not let cadence dictate your form cadence isn't about correcting your form the reason we should get excited about cadence is and actually the figure should be between i believe 175 and 185 that's that's what the cadence we should be looking for so it isn't it doesn't have to be 180 it can be between 175 and 185 because when you're running when your foot hits the ground as i said earlier you have about two and a half times your body weight coming back at you that impact coming back into your body creates a load of elastic energy in the body and that elastic energy has a frequency everything has a frequency a frequency of creation store and release of elastic energy so the foot hits the ground bang you've created the elastic energy yeah it softens as you pass over the foot it stores it and then as the foot leaves the ground the elastic energy fires amazing you've created the energy from nothing you store it and then it leaves with you as you leave the ground but only if you run at a cadence which sinks in with that elastic frequency. And that's what that 175 to 185 is. So if you went out and ran around Central Park at a 180 cadence, you can be as confident as we can be, and there needs to be more research on this, but as confident as we can be that every time you hit the ground, you create elastic energy, you store it as you move through the stride, and then yep. it shoots you off with a, with a burst of elastic energy. So that's really exciting. What we, You would want that. You wouldn't want to be out of sync of that. So that's why cadence is important. What yeah. should people do with their arms and their shoulders and their hands? This is something that I've never had any idea what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. So I think when we run, you know, if you if you if you pulled a hundred people in and said, you know, what do you how do you run? What what do you do? Everyone would say, well, you run with your legs. You know, you use you use your legs to run. Well, you know, it, running is a full body exercise every single piece of your body is moving when you run we have no dividing lines in our body only connecting lines 
And actually, because of our very dexterous hands, because we do everything with our hands and our arms, they're closer to our brain than our legs. We can see them. I think it's fair to say we have a better relationship with these than we do our legs. Yes. So what that means is in movement, in dynamic movement, especially in running, is the arms are incredibly dominant over the legs. So your kinetic movement is such that your right arm and your left leg move together and your left arm and your right leg move together. That's the way it is. But these very, very clever things are telling our not very bright legs what to do. So if you're running around with your legs, carrying your arms and not doing much with them because you can't really leave them at home, but you don't want to waste any energy with them because you want to save the energy for your legs. The arms just not doing much are sending very, very difficult messages for the legs to have to cope with. So Kip Sang, Kapruto, Kip Chogi, they would all tell me they run with their arms. Yeah. They use their arms to run. So the arm swing we're looking for is a very, very relaxed shoulder. And all the dynamic movement is done with the elbow and always to the rear. So the arm is driving constantly to the rear. Very relaxed shoulder, arm movement to the rear, because that's then telling the leg to land underneath you and come out behind you as well. So you're then, not pushing the arm forward. Correct. You pull the arm back, you allow it to pendulum through to the front, and then you pull back, and yeah. then you pull back. You, you never see any air really here. Everything is to the rear, to the rear, to the rear. It's oh, so are you saying are you saying that your um, your upper arm wouldn't ever go much past sort of 90 degrees? Correct. Oh, yeah. so it's even more than that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You Because if your very clever right arm drives forward, you're not very bright, left leg is going to follow it and you're going to land on that heel on a straight leg. So many of those 84% of those 4,000 runners that are heel striking are doing it because their arms are coming out in front of them. Am I right in thinking that by having this slightly more um, posterior focused arm movement that it's going to force us into a more open chest and a more upright posture? Doesn't hurt. Absolutely right. If you're thinking about this, I talk about this sense of line in your body, which is an imaginary line that runs from your belly button up through the abdomen, up through the chest to the top of the head. When you're running, you open up that sense line and put a bow into that sense line that gets your upper body over your center of gravity. It puts more surface area into your elastic system. It brings your hips forward and gets a nice neutral pelvis. And then the arms driving to the rear just completes that beautiful position. You're absolutely right. What about hands? Are hands, fists open, or whatever's comfortable? No, this is exciting. So hands. So we want balance and symmetry in our arms because our arms are dominant over our legs and running is all about balance and symmetry in the body. So if you want balance and symmetry in your arms, your hands must do exactly the same thing. If you run with one hand open and one thumb up, mm. the hands will stop and the thumb will go up. You know, the hands, yeah. the hands send the arms up in crazy positions. So... What I love to see is if you have your index finger onto your thumb, like so, and then the other three fingers just run along. That's it. Perfect. So you would run like that. If you do that, both hands are completely symmetrical. And you know that they are. Your fingertip, your index finger on your thumb is the perfect tension sensor for your body. If you squeeze those fingertips, you can feel the tension going up your arm mm -hmm. and sweeping through your body. If your fingertips are soft, you know the arm is soft. So when you're running, and muscle tension is an athlete's nemesis. We want elastic tension, but not muscle tension. So when we're running, if our fingertips are soft, we know that the upper body is relaxed. If these are tense, we know that the tension is sweeping through. It's like the a canary in the coal mine. Completely, completely. And what also happens is your uh, wrist, your elbow and your shoulder, those joints have tendons and ligaments in those joints that are holding the joints together and holding muscle to bone. They do that job. But the tendons and ligaments also propriocept their position in space. So just like the proprioceptors on the bottom of your foot, the proprioceptors in your joints are giving your dark, silent skull a position of your arm as you move. If your fingertips are touching, you lock in that proprioception better. So you have a better spatial awareness of your arms if your fingertips are touching. They're also great tension sensors and they do something completely symmetrical. That can honestly be a game changer for runners. It I like it. I like it. What yeah. about breathing? 
Yeah, breathing's good. Definitely, breathing is good. Yep, I tried. I've been a fan for all my life. <laughs> sort of tip. So, deep rhythmic breathing into the belly to allow the diaphragm to be able to do the work. If we breathe fast and shallow, we tend to breathe into our chest, and that actually we have to use muscles to do the breathing. And the very oxygen you're getting in by breathing in is a lot of that's going to the muscles to actually do the job. So we don't want to, we often, we often let the movement of our arms and legs dictate our breathing. Yeah. Especially when we're trying to up our cadence in, in that, that's when often it can be a challenge to up our cadence because our breathing wants to get faster to go with this increased cadence that we're looking for. So we, we don't want to completely disassociate the breathing from our movement of our arms and legs because I think, it, you know, it's a, it should be a whole thing. But I think what we should try and aim for, and there's no one size that fits all here, but what I think we should try and aim for is to be able to breathe in for three footfalls and breathe out for three footfalls. That way, that's going to slow the breathing down. Yep. But it's still going to keep it in harmony with the movement because you want the whole thing to try and be together, the breathing, the movement together. We must get our breathing right because if good running is about relaxation and and rhythm in the body we need that in our breathing if we're fighting for air we're not going to move with relaxation and rhythm in our body are we mm. yeah it's it's an interesting one is there something have you found that it's more optimal for people to either end or begin a breath mid stride or as they strike never thought about it yeah never thought about it. i haven't no i haven't wouldn't i wouldn't drill that that i wouldn't you've got to be this is where you think are we overthinking this because it's it's difficult enough if your listeners go out tomorrow and try this it's difficult enough to be able to count three in as your as your have their yeah. thumb and their index finger together as they've got that position yeah i mean it's sl- everything with this is so slow to introduce i'm gonna guess is there a process that you go through do you advise people to say okay so for your running over the next x number of sessions or x number of weeks we're going to focus on hands and shoulders then after maybe someone's introduced that for a period of time then we're going to look at cadence then we're going to look at breathing then we're going you know trying to add too much in at once is going to end up with nothing being done have you got a a protocol for how people can introduce things bit by bit yeah definitely and so one of the big things for everybody to think about here is that if you go out and start changing your movement tomorrow you are not creating new muscle memory. We talk about muscle memory all the time and we assume that we're teaching a muscle to do a new trick. We're not. Muscles don't really remember anything. What we're doing is rewriting our software. We're telling, we're changing our software, which then tells the muscle what to do. So changing your movement is definitely a cognitive thing. Yeah, you're rewriting this. That's quite exciting because I think it makes it, it makes it very doable. We have to understand the challenge to be able to do it. So if you went out for a run, let's say you went out for a five mile run tomorrow, if the first mile you ran beautifully, but the last four weren't great, then actually you're going to you're going to retain the software of the the not great four. Mm. So you start to change your movement. The good movement has got to outweigh the, the not so good movement. So that's the first thing to think about. And so that probably means for some people to go for that little and often approach rather than just long runs. Yeah. So, you know, if you were running 30 miles a week in three runs, you might want to run 30 miles a week, but in five or six runs. So half the distance and just do it twice as often. Because you're focusing more on the biomechanics. Yeah. OK. OK. Exactly. And are you doing, would you say one, do you partition off what you're focusing on? You know, for this period of time, we're focusing on one thing. Yeah. So I think the first thing to really, you know, that that foot being the interface between you and the ground, it's you've got to get that interface right. Like everything else, if the interface isn't good, everything behind it doesn't really work. So the first part of all is to really practice landing that foot well and leaving the ground well and then start to work up the body. And, and yeah, just pick them. It, it's interesting. It all sounds like even the stuff we're talking about, I think, well, I've got to go out. I can't think about all of those things. Yeah. Yeah, the first time you jump in a car. You have to think about the, the clutch and the gears and the and indicator and steering. And you think, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's not long before you can do all of that and chat. And, you know, so what's sensory overload at first? Actually, you get very good at building those motor skills. But, yeah, in the early stages, little and often pick something, work on it. When you feel you've got it, add another skill to it. 
How is it that we've got through an entire conversation about people being good at running and we haven't spoken about lactate threshold or VO2 max or HRV or any of that stuff? Well, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we've done well. Um, I'm, my, I've got a research project going going on with the University of East London at the moment. And that, that research project is uh, 20 sensors that go all over the body. This is running outside, nothing on a treadmill. I always work outside. Yep. I think that's another reason why the Indiana Jones thing because it's only ever research, coach, analyze outside. So we've got these 20, 20 sensors that go all over the body that create 3D models of people running outside, but we're also collecting mobile gases as well. So CO2 levels, oxygen levels. And what we're seeing even now in the early stages, is that our running economy can be bettered by up to 30% just by changing the way that you move. Now, you'd have to work pretty hard to get your VO2 max up just a little bit or your lactate threshold up a little bit. 30%. And that's actually unpracticed. That's when they're not very good at it. They go away and practice. So the gains are huge. And when, when I first yeah. started going to Kenya and Ethiopia, and when the athletes used to come over to Europe to race, they would come through Heathrow and I would kind of gather them up, take them to the university and we'd get them on um, sort of treadmills and they'd be putting all sorts of stuff on them and looking at their lactate thresholds, VO2 maxes. And they were always fantastic. But what was always off the scale was their economy. Yeah, so the economy of movement. It's good to build a big engine, but if you can build a big engine and take the toll of what that engine's got to do down by using elastic energy, by using gravity, by using other things other than thirsty muscles, you don't need such a massive engine. I love it. Shane Benzi, ladies and gentlemen, if people want to keep up to date with what you do, where should they go? Uh, so, um, so it's Running Reborn. So runningreborn.com. You'll find me there and everything that I do and everything I'm getting up to will, will be there. And uh, yeah, it'd be great to see you. Thanks. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.